Thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. Quite a few of you were at our uh, annual customer uh, conference uh, in May. And in that conference, I uh, had a, a session where I gave um, an overview on, on industry trends. And as a result of that, we um, had a lot of conversations with a lot of clients and a lot of great feedback uh, with our surveys that they wanted um, more to get deep, you know, some deep dives into some of those trends. And so we are kicking off a, a webinar series uh, from Engage as an outcome of Engage to really kind of do some deep dives on, on some of the things that we talked about. And one of the things that seems to be top of mind is, is IVR modernization. Um, and, and part of my presentation, I, I gave quite a few examples. Um, but what I thought I would do just to kick things off um, before I hand things over to uh, Alfredo and Robert is just to go ahead and, and kind of recap uh, those trends um, quickly. But before I do that, <laughs> I just want to uh, uh, reinstate uh, Avtech's, uh, our definition, who we are as a company. Um, really, it, you know, it, we are the advantage technology has when realizing a CX strategy. Um, and that's where we play in the market. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll just keep moving along because part of that definition is really helping our clients optimize their technologies um, and really helping them align and drive to a, a greater overarching CX strategy. So when I when I think about trends, and I, I'm I'm speaking on trends quite a bit around this industry, what I would call the the CX and uh, digital transformation industries uh, in which we play, I see all sorts of trends. I saw one presentation someone gave, and they had uh, about 14 different trends. And after the first three, I I, I basically uh, nodded off. So so really, I, I try to simplify things and I try to really take my experiences that I have, not just in the industry, but that I have with, with companies that I do business with and really forming my opinion around what the trends are. And so I, we have what we call a, a GEO top three. My name is George Demu, president and CEO of Avtex and everyone at Avtex uh, are 430 employees. They just they just call me GEO. So, so Geo's top trends, you know, let me just kind of touch on these. The first one is really this, this, this uh, migration from the voice to the mind of the customer. This, this move from what I call the voice to the mind of the customer. And what I mean by that is, is a couple of things. One, I really don't want you to ask me um, how my experience was. Um, I just want it to be a great experience. And I just want you to know if this was a good experience or not. The other thing I, I want um, when, I, when I'm tran transitioning from the voice to the, to the mind of the customer is I want you to know me, I want you to value me, and I want you to help me. And I want you to really understand how I do business with you and what categories I do business with you. And I want you to have premonition on why I'm interacting with you. And I want you to help me uh, shape uh, my future journeys based upon your knowledge or um, what you know about me as your customer. The next one is uh, convergence. And there's a lot of things converging in, in this industry. And, and I usually talk about a couple of them. Um, we all pretty much know that interaction types are merging. So we went from multi-channel to cross-channel to now omni-channel. And so we just need to make sure that we're providing a ubiquitous experience across all of these channels. Um, so, so these channels are converging. Um, the data outputs, the experience, the information uh, has to be transparent across all of these channels. And I need to have um, the same information and processes. The next is technology. So, you know, the contact center platform and the CRM platform are really truly being integrated so tightly, they almost become one. But that doesn't end there. It's all the different repositories of big data, artificial intelligence. For a retailer, it could be a POS system. For a, a, a banking client, it's their uh, back end online core, an online banking platform. So these, all these technologies need to be integrated and converged to really drive, again, that ubiquitous customer experience. Um, the third is kind of the front office and the back office um, really need to converge as well. So what I'm doing on the marketing side of the business, trying to uh, acquire and grow customers, that methodology and that intel has to be brought into the 
the, the back office in the way I service, support, uh, and really manage and retain uh, a client. And then the, the, another one on convergence is the experiences. Um, experiences not just across industry types. We've often heard that I'm going to judge your company by the last best experience I had across any industry. I don't care what industry you're in. But the other thing that's converging is um, really uh, um, my experiences uh, that I have as a consumer and the experiences I have with, with, with an enterprise that are, are, are converging. And so why can I walk into my kitchen um, and tell the, my home assistant, the tower on my uh, center island, to shuffle songs by U2, uh, but I can't ask your IVR what's the outstanding balance due on my client. So these uh, experiences I have from a consumer perspective need to be addressed in the enterprise when your customers are interacting with you. Another popular one is why, why can I do facial recognition on my iPhone, um, but I go through an arduous uh, identification or verification process when I call your organization. Um, so the last one is experience design. And um, we can advance the slide and I'll just touch on that real quickly because this will kind of dovetail into the IVR modernization. So, so what's happening in the industry is um, with the digital transformation um, and the way now companies are going to market, um, really face-to-face uh, -face is really diminishing. Um, and what's happening is procurement interactions are all being taken uh, place uh, through a, a varied growing and increasing number of interaction types. And so these interactions over the next four years are gonna grow about 350%. So you need to really at the front end be designing that experience. And it really starts again with the omni-channel access and then understanding, knowing who your customer is, uh, understanding that persona ID, and then the routing logic, um, understanding that ID so that I can perform uh, a premonition or predictive uh, routing of that client based upon any channel that they may be entering into my organization or uh, wishing for information. And then I need to deliver warm and, warmth and competency. So if you see on the bottom uh, of this chart, uh, it, it, it shows the customer, it shows the omni-channel. And so what we're doing is we, we're building more and more self-service pathways so that we can address this drastically increasing number of interactions. And IVR plays a critical role in that especially because we need to keep in mind we always need a direct pathway to a live agent and if it is a critical call um, and we call that the customer escalation curve you see this bar in red if we know that that client needs to talk to an agent uh, we need to get them there quickly and we need to provide and pass on information uh, quickly to them um, so that's it's seamless transition from the IVR um, to to the agent and then we need to uh, provide continuous analytics around that customer and provide future journey shaping, really providing them more of the types of, of, of uh, journeys that they have based upon the knowledge and ongoing knowledge build that we have of them as a client. So the next slide um, um, really kind of touches on what I call the, the, the root cause of, of what's taking place with all of these different um, interaction types. And this is a, um, uh, a study that was done by Gartner, um, and we participate in some of these, but, but, but this really shows the dynamics that's, that's happening from 2017 to, to 2022, and the great uh, increase in interactions that are coming into your organization. And really a lot of this, again, is being driven by the digital transformation. However, what's interesting here is voice isn't going away. Um, it's really remaining relatively flat, but it's not going away. However, it, it's a different um, level of escalation and critical nature. So if I have a, a voice call with you now, with your organization, it needs to happen. And it could be the only way as, as your customer, I have a live voice interaction in a year, two years, three years with your multi-million, billion dollar organization. So it has to be a great experience. Um, and then the other interesting thing here is IVR, and that's what we're going to talk about today. This orange uh, uh, section here uh, really shows IVR nearly tripling over the next four, four, four and a half years. 
but it's a different type of IVR. It's a modernized IVR. It's an IVR that's cognitive, that um, it, it, it almost feels like a live interaction, and it really is playing as an assistant to the agent, possibly even giving the agent you know, three quarters of the information they need to complete the transaction, where in the past it would be blind. I mean, we've all gone into these IVRs where they, you know, there's eight different options. We fall asleep after the third, and then we're just punching zero or screaming agent or representative. Um, we input information into the IVR. It gets to the agent. What's the first thing they do? They ask us again for our account number, for our visa number. Um, they're they're reinterrogating us uh, from the beginning um, and doing all the verification from from scratch. So. So all these things really drive a poor a customer experience. And really the IVR is the, the front door to your, to your organization. It's the red carpet uh, to your contact center. And so it has to be a great experience. It has to always be on. It has to know me, has to be able to help me. It needs to be equal or better than any consumerization interactions that I'm having uh, as a consumer, whether it's Alexa, Surrey, Cortano, whomever it may be. It needs to provide proactive information based on my profile. And if I am filling out a warranty card or a claim and I'm doing that in the IVR and I get, get halfway done with it, and I can't complete it because I have a question when it goes to the agent, she needs to know me and she needs to have that form half filled out right in front of her to complete, complete the information. So I'm gonna um, stop there because man, the, you know, my employees know I can talk about this stuff forever. Uh, so it's really hard for me to limit myself to 12 minutes, but I think I did it. So I what I'd like to do, I think I'm uh, introducing you, Alfredo, now. No, I think Robert. Oh, starts. Robert. Yeah. Uh, Robert Carl Wakefield is uh, one of our uh, amazing technology evangelists and, and architects. Um, and so I'd like to uh, pass it over to him to kind of take on the next section. Take it away, Robert. Thank you all. Yep, I'm here. So. Um, the whole idea of this is to give you a flavor of what we envision as IVR modernization. Uh, how do you bring the traditional IVR methods that you've been using in the past, tried and true, into the modern age to serve up um, exactly how your customers want to communicate and how we can better serve those customers through this uh, process of calling into your company what is that first impression? What is their experience? How difficult is it to do business with you? We can go on to the next slide here. Can you go to the next slide? There we Thank go. you. So, so really we have to look at your IVR and see what has changed. Um, in the past five years, we've seen tremendous changes on what IVRs can do, how they can better serve customers, and how you can easily implement these features. We've gotten cloud-based services for speech engines. You don't have to build a big monolithic architecture of servers and, and, and intertwined uh, systems to do speech anymore. You can, you can get it out of the box sometimes or uh, through web service. Uh, natural language is now becoming very cost-effective. Um, Text-to-speech, uh, it used to be text-to-speech was very robotic. People heard it, they didn't like it. Nowadays, you can barely um, distinguish the text uh, speech engines from a human voice. It's getting very natural. Uh, there are APIs now available. APIs are permeating the entire industry with the Internet of Things and uh, web services and microservices and all these things that we can tie into so that we can talk together. Uh, we don't have to do a big customization effort. We can just tie into somebody's API and get these, the utilization of what we're looking for. So it allows us for simpler uh, identification, authentication methods, Bots can be brought in and out of your experience without having a huge investment in time to get this. We also have seen recently um, that there is a big decline in the static landline. So people are not calling in from landlines anymore. They're on their mobile phone. And the hardest thing is that they're usually driving, walking, uh, in, a, in somewhere, you know, ordering something at the same time that they're talking on the phone. So they can't push in buttons on the phone. And as you know, when you bring your phone up to your ear, sometimes you're pressing buttons as, and you don't know it. Uh, so having that speech enabled capability is uh, something that's a necessity in the way that people are calling into your systems now. 
if we want to go on there. So what does this word modern in modernization mean? We see it as several points, but speech is the first thing. We see speech now as a not a an option, but a necessity in your in your IVR. It's something that you need to do because people are mobile. People are uh, not wanting to have to push in the buttons anymore. They don't even have buttons on their phone. They have little uh, pads that they uh, press. You know that uh, don't have that look and feel of the old press this anymore. It's a uh, touch this. Uh, we also want personalization in the IVR. We want to know who we're calling or who is calling us, what we're calling for. We want to greet them. We want to tell them where they're valued and also to try to predict a little bit of why they're calling us uh, by look, doing account lookups and being able to figure out their journey. Uh, were they on the website do, filling out a form and didn't finish it? Did they have a reservation uh, saved in their queue and they wanted to be able to finish that with an agent because they had some special issue or special request? Identification. We don't need to have uh, the agent say, hi, can I get your social? Hi, can I get your birth date? Hi, can I get your last five years of uh, residence to identify you? We can do it through voice biometrics, through um, through voice and, and um, or speech and uh, fingerprint and face print uh, through the phone. All these abilities we have now to tie in that mobile device, which is your personal device, which is authenticated every time you pick it up, you know that it's your phone. So if we can use that device as your identification factor, that's gonna help eliminate a lot of these questions when we get handed off to an agent. We also know though that there have to be times where you will need to talk to an agent. It doesn't matter how good that voice bot is or how good that chat bot is, there will be times when you have to talk to a human person to figure out things. And so having that tie in from the IVR, from those chat bots, from the voice bots into uh, the, the contact center agent is going to be a, a very necessity uh, in the future because you're not going to be able to handle everything 100% with that voice bot. Okay, going on. So what does this look like? First of all, these, the way the IVRs are set up now are very different. We don't have to have an engineer going to school for three weeks to learn how to design an IVR. Today's IVRs are built with drag and drop graphical interfaces, very understandable controls, drop downs and selections. So it's not a, pro a process of programming anymore. It's more a process of configuration. So they already have these tools built you just drag and drop these tools into your flow, as we call them. And uh, very simply, as you can see here, this is a stop top down where we are querying a CRM for the telephone number. We're gonna get back all of the information about the caller. If they are a diamond level caller, we're going to play a special message that says, thank you for being a diamond member uh, caller. Or otherwise, oh, thank you for calling. We hope you could be a diamond member one day. Um, so we could provide that personalization based on those inputs that we have. Um, directed speech, TTS, all these things that we're gonna talk about in a little bit are just a matter of configuration in the IVR. Pretty much any of the modern day IVRs out there, including products like Genesis Pure Connect and Pure Cloud, have these capabilities built into the IVR without the customizations. Going on. So here's an example of a data lookup. And again, on the left-hand side, we have uh, Connect, uh, Pure Connect, and on the right-hand side, we have an example for Pure Cloud. Uh, we could tie into legacy um, uh, systems through ODBC, but we can also tie into modern um, web services through XML and REST and be able to uh, access data without a lot of customization. We just place in the REST API into the package uh, for instance, on the right-hand side, we're looking at a Salesforce where we're getting a count by phone number. We just stick in, hey, there's the call, Annie. The Annie is the telephone number from the outside caller, and it's going to come back with the ID, the name, the account number. We can go cloud to cloud, cloud to prem. So if you have a that back-end database that needs to be accessed, a simple web service on an IIS server, Pure Cloud or Coasted uh, Pure Connect can connect into that web service and then access those back-end operations. 
And again, you're not talking about programming here, you're just talking about configuring a few things within the interface. Going on. So when we look at speech, uh, one of the biggest things is that we have uh, a difference in what was, what is, and what could be. Uh, so we started out with DTMF. Uh, the original IVRs were press one for this, press two for that, press three for that. And I think since about 1971, when we first got these in, uh, it hasn't changed much. You call into systems these days and they still say, you know, press one for sales, press two for support, press three for customer service. Uh, they don't really have any beyond your one through nine. They might have a star for go back, but pretty much it's been the same for the past 30, 40 years on these things. Just these days is what we call directed speech. And this gives the user the option to speak those, but we have a fallback to DTMF. We don't understand them in any case. The biggest difference between direct to speech and natural speech is the options you're providing to your callers. I liken it to my teenage boys, 15, 16, and 18. I come home and I say, hey, what would you like for dinner? Crickets, they don't know, they can't tell me. But if I say, hey, would you like Mexican or Italian for dinner? Right away, Mexican. Or if I give them a choice, they can answer quickly. They get exactly what they're asking for because I haven't given them much of a choice. I've given them two choices. But in an IVR, instead of coming in and just saying, hi, what would you like to do? You're going to get crickets for most of your callers because they don't know what they want to do. They don't know which departments you have available and which routing you could do. But in a directed speech, you can take that same, what would you like to do, and say, hi, thank you for calling. Are you calling for sales, service, or customer support? And they know then they can choose between those three. It also gets us a very, very, very high reliability over natural language. Most natural language systems will be between about 65 and 80% accurate. You're never going to get a natural language system that's 100%. That's just not possible these days. Maybe in three to five years time, we'll get that. But because of dialects and the way we say things and the possibilities of how we say things. So I might say, I'd like to make a reservation. I need to make a reservation. I wanna book a reservation. All of these different variations in that speech, the AI or the natural language has to know how to parse out that information. But if we're giving them choices, would you like to make a reservation or check on an existing reservation? Existing reservation. And so I can very quickly get to it. I also have a very defined, what we call a grammar set. So I can e easily identify what the user is saying, no matter how they say it. If they have a strong accent, I can still match it using some phonetic um, masking in that directed speech. We can account for the way things are said. I like to say like, IBM. IBM, you can't just type the letters IBM. The computer will see that as IBM, and nobody says IBM, um, so we actually have to type it in phonetically, E-Y-E-B-E-A-M, uh, or E-H-M, so I-B-M, so that it can understand the actual phonetics of that word, not the actual text that's being uh, written out there. So it allows us very high accuracy, it allows better routing and a much better experience for the customer. Because the worst is when you call in and you say, customer service, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Customer support, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Can you repeat that? Customer service, I'm sorry, let me get you to a representative who can help you. That's one of the worst experiences when the natural language does not work, it fails. And using that directed speech, we can allow that to be much at, more accurate and have a better experience for the customer. Let's move on to the next slide. And we're just a look about uh, directed speech, how easy it is to do. On the bottom left, we have a pure cloud interface, and you can see I have a menu selection with a DTMF of one, so they can press one, but I've also put in there account balance, balance, account information. I can have multiple words in there. I can have variations on the words uh, and, and even phrases in there that can help me to direct people with that speech. 
on the upper right is a peer connect and again it's built into the interface um, in the attendant where we can go in and we can define what the speech recognition is for a particular um, menu selection and in here I've done help or operator instead of just pressing zero um, it could be representative it could be uh, assistance whatever you'd like it to say but by having that in there, you're allowing that mobile user to navigate without having to take their phone away from their ear, press a button, and put it back to the ear to see if it got directed to the right place. They can just say operator, or they can say account balance. We can also make it so that they can say it anytime. So if you have an operator and you want it anytime that they say operator throughout your menu, it will go to this location. And uh, both of them, Pure Connect and Pure Cloud, allow for that, uh, what we call you know, um, jumping to the node, uh, being able to go back to that node at any time that you say that phrase. So it helps you to consolidate and, and make your, your call flow much simpler as well. If we could go on. So natural language is something that is coming in. There are companies out there like Nuance and Lumenvox that have server-based and now web you know, web uh, service-based products that do that. We're also be seeing a big influx of AIs from Microsoft, Google, Amazon, who are providing uh, AI-based natural language. Um, we have inside currently PureCloud built into the product, built as a tool inside PureCloud, where you can call a Lex-based to enter, in this case, a social security number. We've implemented this for a um, insurance company that has alphanumeric IDs. So instead of, you know, how would you enter an ID of ABD12S562? You could not do that through DTMF. It's just not possible. The old uh, NLUs had a very tough individual but nowadays the AIs can say okay I need to see three letters and then two numbers and a, and a letter and then two more numbers and a letter so they can parse out and know that what their speech needs to be a letter or a number and those can be very accurate as well we did this for another uh, insurance company that wanted a change of address and agents were spending five to ten minutes on change of address they now have a bot that asks what street are you on what is your house number? What is your city? What is your state? What is your zip? It puts it into a database. It is uh, checked against a, a current uh, an address to make sure it, it is a valid address, and then um, places that into the database so the user has can, can confirm the address. They can change the address, and it's put right back in the system without an agent ever uh, handling the call. So it makes it very easy to implement. It it is very um, uh, self-explanatory when you go to create these bots because they have designed the big three Microsoft Google and, and Amazon have created these bots for anybody to use it's not a, uh, a again an engineer that is designing these things business users can go and design bots they have tutorials they have examples so it's very easy to build the bot and it's very easy to use the bot in this example we just say what the bot name is what variables, and then what the intents, what what I'm going to get back from the bot, and they're going to give me a serial number, a, a social security number in this case. Uh, the nice thing about a bot is that they usually learn how things are said. So if you're asking for uh, what would you like to do, and you have a reservation system, it can learn the difference between I'd like to book a reservation and I'd like to make a reservation. And it can learn over time how people are saying that utterance and know that it was correct or not based on the response that they get back from the user or maybe the feedback that we provide that bot of where it was sent to eventually. Uh, the, the feedback from a wrap-up code, say, writing back to the bot and saying it was a wrong um, location or it was sent to the wrong place and let the bot learn from that. So this learning ability of the bot is something that is that is coming. It's not quite there. It's getting good, um, and it, it is uh, providing us a way to expand our vocabulary without having to think of all the different ways that people would say things. Going on? So um, quick demo real fast of something that we designed. 
Um, text to speech is something that uh, people say, oh, I don't like the way text to speech sounds. You know, it doesn't sound good. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a text to speech that we did where they wanted to inform people um, when they called in, the, the workers, whether or not that store was open because there was construction or a holiday or whatever, or a restaurant in this case. And so we allowed them to use email or speech to text to change the greeting. We have it stored into a table that you see in the middle there. And these rows can be updated uh, but via email or via t uh, speech to text. And then when they call in and ask for this specific particular restaurant, it will read back that exact same speech. So I'm going to play this for you. Thank you for calling Bloom and Brands for Spanish. Say Spanish. Which restaurant are you calling for? Outback. Outback, Outback Restaurant 1234 is currently closed for business. Please check back in 24 hours. So you can see, very simple of IVR, but utilizing that text to speech, we have a very natural voice saying uh, that whatever that uh, message is that the owner or the manager of that restaurant wants to communicate. They can do this from their cell phone. They get SMS in that, that message um, at any point in time. They might be at a construction site and they see that they're delayed and they're not going to be able to open for another week. They could update it. People can call in and get that message instantly. So utilizing text-to-speech allows us very dynamic and very timely updates to the prompts. We don't have to go in and record a new prompt. We can just update it with text-to-speech, and it can be updated anywhere uh, based on that text that you provide, or even calling in and using speech-to-text to record, listen to that message, convert it to text, and then put it into our, our call flow. So I'm going to turn this over to Alfredo to give you another couple of examples of how we uh, look at modernization. Thank you, Robert. Um, all right. Uh, this is Alfredo, everybody. I'm going to walk you through the remainder of the slides. The first one that we have here is another example. Uh, in this case, uh, what we have on the screen here is just a quick screenshot of a knowledge base that we've created just to illustrate natural language speech. Um, so basically, we've created this knowledge base. We turned one of those cloud NLU engines onto it and said, here, this is what you have to work with. So basically, what you do is on the left-hand side, you set up the, uh, the context, so technical support. How do I change my password? I have a complaint. So those are all contexts of conversations or intent um, that the caller might have. You define the questions like, how may this context be entered, right? So how can we understand that they're trying to talk about this? So these are the questions that we may hear. And we don't have to, unlike directed speech, we don't have to set up uh, all of the phonetics and so on. We just type the phrases in there, and it uh, takes care of the phonetics for us. Um, but we're trying to determine their intent and, uh, and fall into one of those uh, categories on the left. The answer that we have is based on our detection of that uh, context. So uh, I'm going to call in. You're going to hear me say, you know, I have a problem with my password. But I'm locked out of my account, any of those things. And you're going to hear the answer here. If you need help resetting the password, we can help by sending you a link, et cetera. And then there's some metadata tags on the far right that kind of uh, wrap around this entry and uh, provide additional guidance for what to do with this. So if you have a caller that enters into this context, what do we do with that caller? So in the example of how do I change my password, I'm going to, at the end, actually hear a follow-up prompt that's going to say, did we help you, yes or no? And if they say yes, we're going to send them, uh, you, you know, we're going to say, what else can we do for you? If we say no, then we're going to actually move into a different context, which is, would you like to speak with somebody in technical support? Um, so those are metadata tags. And, and then further down, if you look at I have a complaint based on where they say their complaint is, you can see that there is a queue that's being selected uh, based on their response, and that determines the routing. So we're going to do precision routing based on what we understood of the intent of their conversation. So without further ado, I'll dial in. Before I dial in, I actually wanted to kind of clear this site here. Uh, let me uh, hit a five. There we go. 
So this is just a web page that shows you live when I dial in what the engine is hearing. So you're going to see live in real time through this cloud to cloud integration what I'm hearing in this engine. So here we go. Hello, how can I help you today? I have a complaint. Is your complaint about accounting or operations? Marketing. Okay, I'll connect you to somebody in marketing. Okay, so that was my first quick example. So you can see that without any tuning, without any phonetic spelling and so on, just by pointing the NLU engine to that knowledge base and having the metadata around the entries, it was able to perform, uh, have that quick conversation and what sounded like very natural speech. I'm going to give you one last example on the password thing. So here we go. Hello, how can I help you today? I'm locked out of my account. If you need help resetting your password, we can help by sending you a link to reset it. Visit Forgot Password on our site to start this process. Our technical support team can walk you through this process as well. Does that answer your question? No. How else can I help you? Let me talk to somebody in support. Okay, I'll connect you to somebody in technical support. Uh my phone back hang up okay so what you heard there and what you saw on the screen was a pretty real-time transcription of my speech to text then analysis of that text and decisioning based on that analysis right so that's what we're talking about with these modern cloud-based uh, natural language understanding uh, sites and by the way it's two separate clouds performing this uh work here you're seeing the transcript in one cloud whereas the nlu is a separate cloud so there's cloud to cloud integration here and you saw just how fast that actually was. Um, so let me get back to my slide deck here. All right, um, so moving on. Now, uh, so we've given you examples of TTS. Uh, we've given you uh, a, a, an idea of the quality level that we have with TTS, as well as with natural language understanding uh, solutions that are available today, how ubiquitous the, they've become, and how that's driving the economics of this whole IVR uh, solution down right and the capabilities way up what you can do out of the box but let's now talk about personalization which is uh, very important if we're trying to uh, provide a, a frictionless a seamless uh, customer experience right so we want to actually play on that part that George mentioned in the beginning which is know me when I call in I want you to know it's Alfredo calling in I'm your customer and I want you to have a good idea if not be spot on with the intent that I'm calling about. So personalization means, of course, therefore, that not everybody's gonna get the same IVR. If Robert calls in, it's gonna say, hey, Robert, I recognize your number, thank you for calling back. Are you calling about your flight today to Minneapolis, right? Um, if I call in, I may get a completely different experience because I don't have a flight today, but I do have a, 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 an itinerary on hold that I might be calling about. So that lookup into member journey across all channels will guide that IVR personalization. The IVR is going to greet you. It's going to welcome you back. It's going to know when the last time it interacted with you with uh, with you was, but it's also going to know what you've done in other channels. Uh, so your entire customer journey is going to be, uh, you know, available to that IVR. It's going to understand where you are in that journey and your most probable intent. And then if the caller falls out of IVR, meaning you know the IVR did not help me, then the routing will be correct. It'll be precise to the group that can most likely, or, or better yet, to the agent that can most likely help this customer in the language that they want for the uh, specific intent that they have on this call. And that agent who receives this transfer is also gonna receive the context of this current journey and previous journeys as well. So this current interaction with the IVR, what happened in the IVR, including any authentication. So if I've already provided my credentials and authenticated, which we'll talk a little bit about later, then the agent needs to know that and not re-interrogate me. So we've touched on that. And they also need to know what I've done before this IVR interaction. So on the website, on mobile, across all channels. That's personalization. So what I have here, and I hope this plays correctly through the, the webinar, 
is two examples of personalization. One, and I just recorded these by dialing into these last night. I have accounts with Marriott and Bonvoy, and it recognizes me when I dial in. And this is a pretty standard thing. So one of the things that they might do is they might say when you call in, hey, I noticed you're calling in from the number that is on your account. Would you like me to recognize you every next time that you call in uh, from this number and assume that it's you? And of course, if this is my cell phone, I'll probably say yes. If this is my home phone, I may say no, because both my wife and I have that number in my account, but they're setting up personalization. And then from that point forward, I'm gonna have a more personalized experience, which would sound like this. Thank you for calling Marriott Bonvoy member service. I think I recognize this phone number. Am I speaking with Alfredo? Yes. For security purposes, please tell me the zip code on your Marriott Bonvoy account. Notice that I have the option of speaking or DTMFing that. Thanks. How can I help you today? You can say things like make a reservation or what's my points balance? Okay. So that's one example. Here's the other Delta Airlines. Hi. Thanks for calling Delta, KLM, and Air France. Welcome back, Alfredo. If you want to change your seat, check your SkyMiles account rebook or cancel your flight, please go to delta.com. Otherwise, in a few words, please tell me what you're calling about today. Like plan a trip, change my reservation, or check the status of my flight. Okay, so that those were two similar experiences, slight differences. One of the things that Delta did was right up front, they told us what the IVR does not handle. So for those things, go to our website. For everything else, we can help you here and it's gonna be a natural language type of experience, right? Just tell me what you want. You can say things like this or that, okay? Let's see if I can advance my slide here. There we go. So to personalize an IVR, you need to identify that customer. You need to identify them uh, in a way that is easy and uh, transparent using information that they're gonna know or things, uh, tokens of identification or even tokens of authentication that they're gonna have on them, like their phone number. If it's a cell phone and it's not being spoofed, that's a great way to identify a customer. So if you have an IVR that is a consumer-driven IVR that's gonna provide account information or individualized information like shipment status, order status, things like that, the first thing you have to do is identify that caller. Long account numbers should be avoided. Caller ID should be used as a primary identifier there are some technologies that we're going to talk about in a, a, a slide coming up that help you make sure that that caller ID is not being spoofed so you're not falsely identifying a customer when it's actually uh, uh, an imposter. Secondary authentication factors can be used, like you heard Marriott ask for my zip code on my account. That's good. So they were using caller ID and zip code. So two factors for identifying me. Now, they probably wouldn't let me transfer $5,000 offshore to my Swiss account if they were a bank with just that level of, of identification or authentication. And that's coming up uh, here in a, in, a, in a slide, but simple enough to do and good enough for the level of operations that, or transaction that Marriott is gonna let me do, such as canceling a reservation, right? There's a balance between how easy and frictionless you wanna make the experience and the risk of uh, of uh, uh, you know a fraudulent experience uh, based on what the IVR is actually offering. So let's talk about authentication. So if you do need to authenticate a customer before allowing them to do uh, transactions, especially ones that are higher risk or have a higher potential of monetary loss, right, or, or data loss, then you want to authenticate them at different levels of strength. So a simple PIN can be used for low risk uh, operations. When you call into your cell phone carrier, T-Mobile might ask you, you know, what's your PIN? And then uh, that gets passed to the agent. They know it's you and they won't ask you for anything else. But if you then ask them for a higher level transaction, like I need to port my cell phone number to a different carrier, they might ask you for more information at that point, right? Um, there are also, like we mentioned a second ago, transparent methods of authentication. So for example, um, uh, there are solutions out there that are cloud-based solutions 
uh, that will detect risk on an incoming call. They'll actually look at things like the carrier signaling on that incoming call and see whether it looks good or not. So that's transparent to the caller and that's very techie type stuff. But basically, if you look at an incoming call and you look at the, the carrier level information that is on that call when it's set from the carrier like an AT&T or Verizon into your system or platform, cloud platform, there is some data that, that users and you know, never see, but that tell us, hey, is this a legitimate call coming from a legitimate carrier on the sourcing side, or is this potentially being spoofed or coming from some magic jack in Eastern Europe? Um, and so that is transparent level of risk detection, right? And so we're trying to kind of clear hurdles away, clear risk levels away. The other thing, the third sub bullet that I have here is real-time SIM and device authentication. So there are providers out there that will uh, look at the call as it's arriving and actually go back through the carrier networks, through the phone company networks and say, who owns this subscriber number today? And then T-Mobile will say, I do. And then they'll say, well, can you check and see if this subscriber is making a call on your network right now to me? And T-Mobile will say, yes, just a second. And in under four seconds, the caller doesn't notice this because we're just playing ring ring to them. You get a green or red kind of confirmation saying, yes, this is the legitimate subscriber calling from a legitimate device. And if you then know that this is not a spoofed call because you got that verification, and it's also the 10 digit phone number that is on the account that's, that's, that access is being attempted for, that's a strong authentication factor. I know the call is coming from Robert's cell phone, and I know that this caller on this call is trying to gain access to the account that that number is listed on already. For example, the Robert's bank account. So I've got his cell number on his bank account. I know that call is not being spoofed. It's either Robert or somebody who's, who's got a hold of his phone. And that's a strong and transparent, so very frictionless authentication method. That is being used more and more in IVRs where secure account access is uh, imperative to provide a very expedited experience for the caller that is also very secure. So you provide differentiated IVR treatment when you have those green check marks on that incoming caller. Okay, so that's that on authentication. And then the last slide I have here is on biometrics and one-time pins. So even if you've done what I just mentioned, and now let's say that on the previous slide, we did all those transparent things and then Robert's calling into his bank and he's gotten access to his bank account with his, uh, you know, all the transparent stuff. Plus he's also provided us the last four of his social. So now we let Robert check his balance. We let Robert look at the last three deposits or transactions on his bank account, his checking account, his saving account, et cetera. But now, Robert says, you know what? I want to reset my password. I want to reset my PIN to get into my account. Or I want to transfer money to um, somebody else's account, whether in the bank or at another financial institution, which you know may not even be doable in the IVR, but maybe it is. So an elevated risk uh, transaction. At that point, what we might want to do is what's called step-up authentication, where we say, all right, Robert, we'll let you do this, but we've got to send you a one-time random PIN number via SMS. Just like when you set up two-step authentication in your Gmail account, same thing, but the IVR can do it. So I'll let you reset that PIN. I'm going to go ahead and send you a random one-time PIN via text, and I'm going to send it to the cell number that I have on your account, which ends in 1234. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, PIN is set. If you have it handy now, uh, enter it via your phone or speak it to me and then Robert speaks it, and then we complete the reset of his password in the IVR. If he doesn't have a cell phone handy, he might still have four hours to call back in and complete that, and the PIN might still be valid. This is all customizable in the IVR. So these secondary out-of-band authentication uh, challenges can be used in an automated IVR to provide much more secure authentication to um, you, you know, where needed in these risky transactions. The other out-of-band authentication you can do is using biometrics. So you can either do it using voice biometrics within the phone call itself. So Robert, I see you've signed up for our voice biometrics with the bank. Would you mind repeating the phrase 
the dog is walking down the street, press prompt when you're ready, uh, press pound sign when you're ready to start, then just speak freely. Robert repeats that, we authenticate Robert, now we allow him to change his PIN. That's done inside the phone call, so we call that in band, it's in the call. The last bullet talks about out of band, so we can actually use push authentication. The one-time PIN was an example, I can also use biometrics for that. So if the bank has a mobile app, we can put biometrics in it. And so that mobile app will then allow you to use facial recognition, voice signature, uh, fingerprint, things like that. And what we'll do is you're calling into the IVR, you're asking to reset your password. We can do that, but we're gonna ask you if you have the mobile, we're gonna see that you're enrolled in the mobile app into biometrics. We're gonna send you a challenge and we're gonna tell you, hey, please look at your uh, smartphone because the uh, bank mobile app, bank's mobile app is going to pop up and ask you to go through a biometric challenge. It's gonna ask for a selfie or a phrase repeat or a fingerprint on your uh, fingerprint reader on your phone. Once you do that, it'll then let you complete the transaction. So these are all new things that are available out there and being done today by Aptex clients. Okay. All right. Uh, um, I don't know, uh, Whitney, I believe we want to go through this last part with the free giveaway that we have today for the audience and then get into questions. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So Robert, I'll pass the microphone back over to you. So we thank you all for your time that you've been here today. We did want to appreciate um, um, you a little bit by giving you a free giveaway. Uh, we understand that this process of monetization might be a, a method of, or a, a condition of you don't know what you don't know. And so we're here to help you through that. So we are going to be giving away to each participant um, a free modernization IVR assessment. This is typically what our customers of Avtax will normally get in their process of, of QBRs and consulting engagement that we provide to our valued customers. But we are extending this to everybody who has attended today. We're going to be dialing into your IVR, assessing the IVR experience, figuring out ways of doing the modernization potential um, that you might have in your system to help that customer experience and show you similar um, experiences across the same industry of what other people are doing. Uh, give you some insights and recommendations on what we think you should be looking at in this modernization effort. And we did mention this is free. So uh, we are providing this assessment for free where you're gonna be uh, given the information and uh, you're free to take it and assess what is important to you and your business and your and how you wanna serve your customers. So an example of what we are providing at the end is uh, a full insights report that's gonna give you recommendations on uh, speech and personalization and TTS and all these capabilities as long along with uh, many good graphics and uh, recommendations. So like here, we will be going through your IVR, checking things for whether the prompts are consistent, uh, whether you only have DTMF or you have natural speech or directed speech, um, uh, whether you offer uh, personalized service for people. So uh, these are things that we will recognize and then analyze uh, what your system is capable of and to make suggestions on how to make this a better experience for your customers. So again, we thank you for your time. We do have a bit of time for questions. I know that there's a couple of questions about with this recording and the slides, and we will send out links for those after the uh, webinar when we get this uh, recording down and up on a site for you. Uh, any other questions, be feel, uh, feel free to use the question box there, or if you'd like to, you can raise your hand and uh, we can um, do a verbal question as well. Hey, Robert, we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, so the first one is, how do we know if our system can do what you're showing us? Very good question. Um, we know Genesis very well. So if you are one of our customers, we know exactly what is installed in your Connect server. We know what type of licenses you have. Some of these others, uh, we do have expertise in things like Avaya and Cisco. And so we are aware of what they can do um, and be able to guide you in those areas. Uh, but it's mainly um, a, a review of what your system is at and what level of software you have and determining exactly what the uh, 
the cost and, and effort to add either into your existing system or to replace maybe your system to get these feature sets. But I can tell you any modern IVR that has uh, been updated in the past couple of years probably has a lot of what we've been talking about today. And Perfect. the one thing I would add to that is that it is, and we've done this with some clients where their uh, platform that they have on premise may be, uh, you know, older platform, their IVR may be older. We have connected premise based platforms with a cloud IVR that has these capabilities to provide the, uh, the IVR experience, a self-service experience. And if it falls out, then there's a seamless handoff back to the premise system so that's a, a possibility as well so don't just uh you know drop your shoulders and uh and and walk away if it seems like the system you have won't be able to do these things because there there is the potential of uh, integrating to the cloud and uh, having a handoff from prem to cloud and then back if there's a, a need for an agent i think that helps answer this last question we got into about if they have to upgrade their system to get these features. Yeah, I want to say a lot of the systems that have been installed in the past couple of years, probably not. Um, you might have a patch, you might have a, a small update, but upgrades, you know, like feature releases and, and uh, going through a major uh, forklift upgrade is usually not necessary, especially with the new speech technologies that we can tie into um, for bots and stuff, we can provide these, like uh, Alfredo was saying, possibly in the cloud and connected to your system. So we can do that pre-processing of the IVR in the cloud and then route to your existing system to get to the agent. Yeah, that, that's a very important point. And like uh, you probably have picked up on, there's no single answer. It depends on the system you have, the manufacturer, Cisco, Avaya, Mitel, Shortel, in contact, you, you name it. And we're glad to have an individual conversation with you about solutions that can provide you this next uh, gen IVR experience that's, that's out uh, today. Um, it can be as simple as you have SIP trunks and we put an SBC in, on the SIP trunks that has the ability to connect directly to a, an IVR bot. And then from that point, it can then fall into your prem system unchanged. Uh, so there are a lot of ways of uh, placing a modern IVR in front of a legacy system. And we'll be glad to have individual conversations with you about that. Yeah, the, the beauty for a lot of our clients that are on the Genesis platform, you, you have uh, an all-in-one solution. So you have the capabilities um, there within the, the layer of applications. It just may, may be um, uh, tuning, um, programming, uh, possibly you know, lighting up some, some more uh, trunking capabilities depending on usage studies uh, and some natural language licenses. But you, you have the capability to do a lot of the things that we were talking about um, in this presentation. I just saw one that came in and um, they're asking about the standalone systems. Are they uh, Genesis or are they separate programs? Uh, it's really, as, as George said, it's an individual thing. We might say, okay, well, let's just do a voice bot on Microsoft or Lex and then pass it into your existing IVR. So it could be outside of the Genesis product. It could be that, hey, let's put pure cloud um, as your IVR to do all of this modernization. And then you can still pass it into your connect product without upgrading or adding licensing. It looks like real quick, we just have one more question that came in asking about how do we get the IVR evaluation um, started? How do folks reach out about that yeah. offer? If you are an Aptex client, you would reach out to your client account manager and they would uh, take care of that for you. If you are not an Aptex client, you would reach out. Whitney, what would be the best way for them to reach into Aptex uh, as a follow up? Is there an email or something will come with the uh, webinar registration to them? Yeah, so the easiest way is after this webinar is over, there's going to be a pop-up that appears on everyone's screen that's going to ask them if they're interested in this IVR 
offer. Um, so just simply hitting a yes button, we will reach out to you guys directly about getting that process started. Um, and also we'll include a link with more information in our follow-up email with the recording. That's even better. That's, that's a very modern and uh, excellent customer experience you provided there. Way to go, Whitney. <laughs> Well, and I think for our clients of Aptex, what, what's important to us is, is we continue to, to partner with you is to, you know, we want to be your advisory services. We want to be a place you can go to for, for these types of things to, to leverage and optimize um, the technologies that you have within your organization. So um, Alfredo mentioned a lot of you, all of you should have a client account, a dedicated client account manager um, that can help you with that and pull in architects and pre-sales engineering um, and business analysts uh, at, at need um, to help you accomplish the, the promise of, of the platform that you acquired from, from Aptex. Yep, absolutely. Your client account manager will be able to pull in a solutions architect. Uh, we have a team of nearly 20 uh, architects that can have these conversations uh, in detail with you, so, and we'd be glad to, to join you on a call to discuss. Great, okay. look for the next invite on another trend that we're gonna do a deep dive on. Um, I think it's gonna be around uh, advanced call, call and interaction distribution and um, premonition routing and identification uh, logic. So look forward to that and we'll be talking with you soon. Thanks everyone, have a great day.